Uh, Let's have a Bible reading and we'll look to our passage today, which is the uh, second chapter of 1 John. Uh, These letters at the back of the Bible that uh, are small but pack an incredible punch. Uh, And as we read them, we gain much from them. So I'm going to read uh, 1 John, chapter 2, from verses 18 to 27. 1 John 2, 18 to 27. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, They would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you... See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. This is the word of the Lord, and uh, I want to welcome our brother Tim Blake uh, to come and uh, speak to us on this passage. Good morning, Tim. Good to see you and look forward to your ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word, the Bible. We pray that you would speak powerfully today to convict us through your Holy Spirit of the truth. Bring us to repentance where we have failed to walk in the light and bring us to worship where we are convicted by your truth. Help us to abide in you and to persevere to the end. Conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray and ask all of these things. Amen. Well, I want to start today by asking you a question. I wonder if you've ever had the opportunity to ask a friend or a family member or even a stranger, what do you think about Jesus? Who do you think he was? Have you ever put yourself out there and asked that question? Now, when you ask that question, as many surveys have over recent years, it turns out that people's answers tend to fall into one of four key views. Firstly, and this one might surprise you, view number one, Jesus didn't exist. In doing my research for this sermon, I've seen a number of different surveys asking people who they think Jesus was. And depending on the survey, between 20 and 40% of the people surveyed stated that they didn't even think Jesus existed. Does that surprise you? Surprise me. Despite there being better evidence for the existence of Jesus than for almost any other person in history, some people still don't believe that he was even a real person. So that's the first view. Jesus didn't exist, but how about view number two? View number two says that Jesus was a moral teacher or a prophet. I'm sure you've heard that view before. The idea that Jesus did exist and he said some good stuff, 
and maybe we can even learn from that stuff, but there's no way he's actually God. Perhaps we can pick and choose from a few of the wise things he said, but ultimately he was a sandal-wearing teacher. And then we have view number three, that Jesus was just a man. Again, the idea that Jesus did exist, but he wasn't anything special. And because we really can't trust the Bible, um, other than acknowledging that he was a real person, there isn't anything that we can really say about him. Well, finally, view number four, that Jesus was God in human form. Now, this is what I believe, and I trust that many of you believe this too, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. God in human form. One person with two natures, fully God and fully man. So four basic views, three of them clearly the wrong view of Jesus. Jesus didn't exist, Jesus was a moral teacher or a prophet, and Jesus was just a man. These are some of the key ways in which people can have wrong views of Jesus. But even within the right view that Jesus was God in human form, there can still be subtle but important differences that cause a view of Jesus to be a heretical view of Jesus. Throughout the last 2,000 years of church history, there has been almost every conceivable wrong view of Jesus. I thought I'd give you a few examples in no particular order, and we might learn some new words today. Firstly, docetism, the idea that Jesus was God, but he wasn't actually man. He just appeared to be a man. He wasn't physically real. He wasn't made of matter because matter is inherently evil. Well, what about another one? Ebionism, the idea that Jesus was a gifted man, a descendant of David, but not God. A man adopted by God as his son, but not God. Or how about Arianism, the idea that Jesus was created by God. Jesus didn't always exist in this view, but was created by God at a point in time. And as a result, Jesus is distinct from and subordinate to God. Or well, how about a more modern heresy known as kenosis, based on an incorrect reading of the phrase emptied himself in Philippians. The idea that Jesus gave up his God nature when he became a man and was just a man in right relationship with God. And I could go on. But the point I want to make is that these are all wrong views of who Jesus is. And whilst, whilst this might all seem a bit theological, this really matters because these views of Jesus are not sufficient for salvation. We can't just make Jesus who he, we want him to be and then not expect that to have consequences. And looking at these various heresies about the nature of Jesus is also a reminder that it's important for us to be students of church history. Brothers and sisters, in the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, many faithful and courageous believers have made a stand for the right view of Jesus. And in some cases, it has cost followers of Jesus their lives. Brothers and sisters, we should have some understanding of church history so we don't repeat these errors out of respect for those who stood up for the truth, but most importantly, because false views of Jesus are not sufficient for salvation. So as we come to today's passage, I just want to spend a few minutes looking at where we are in the book of 1 John. And remember the incredible power of the testimony of John, who was one of Jesus' closest friends on earth, the disciple whom Jesus loved, as we read in Jordan's Gospel. And who better to testify to the truth of the Gospel and who Jesus is than the man who walked so closely with him during his time on earth? Remember that in the last few weeks we've seen John remind his readers of the fundamentals of the Christian faith these simple and profound statements of gospel truth. 
that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That the one who says he abides in Jesus ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And that the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And from the very opening verses, John has been at pains to point out Jesus' humanity as well as his deity. Remember in verse 1 of chapter 1 we read this, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. See how John emphasises the many senses with which he experienced Jesus' humanity, sight, touch, hearing. And as we put together the various clues throughout this letter, we get the sense that John is writing, in part at least, to counter a specific heresy. He's writing to correct a wrong view of who Jesus is. There's another clue in 1 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, which reads, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Again, we see John emphasising the humanity of Jesus. And I think this is a further clue as to the heresy that John is addressing. Influenced by Greek and particularly by Platonic thought, we have this early stage form of a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism placed a strong emphasis on the distinction, the dichotomy between the physical and the spiritual. Gnostic Christians claimed to have access to secret knowledge about the nature of the universe the nature of Christ and what his appearance on earth meant to believers. In Gnostic thought, God is perfect and exists in the spiritual realm. And the idea that God would take the form of a man as imperfect physical matter didn't make sense to them. The idea that a perfect spiritual God would take on imperfect physical flesh was offensive. Most Gnostics believed that Jesus was not incarnated into a human body. They preached the idea known as docetism, that Jesus only appeared to be in the form of a human so that he could communicate with humanity. And so John's choice of language in this letter and in his gospel isn't accidental. The idea of Jesus as the word in John chapter 1. God as light in whom there is no darkness, The choice of language is explicitly countering the idea that Jesus couldn't have been God and man that was at the heart of the Gnostic heresy. But I don't want us to get too caught up in Gnosticism. The key point here is that John is reminding us in order to have a saving faith in Jesus, we need to believe in the right Jesus not some mystical view of Jesus handed down by teachers with secret knowledge. And similarly, in the context of today's wrong view of Jesus, not an all-loving slot machine Jesus who gives us everything we want without demanding anything of us. Not a Jesus who is just a man in right relationship with God, but by understanding the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, fully man and fully God. Two natures in one person. The Jesus who spoke the universe into existence and upholds all things by the word of his power. The Jesus who died and was raised to life after three days. The Jesus who calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. 
the Jesus who sits at the right hand of God and will soon return in glory and in power, the real Jesus. So let's turn to today's passage. If you could open up your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. John opens today's passage by addressing his readers as children. And we've seen this term before, haven't we? He starts chapter 2 with, my little children. In verse 12, I am writing to you, little children. In verse 13, I have written to you, children. And next week's passage also starts with, now, little children. And perhaps after last week's passage, where John addressed fathers, young men and children, there's some sense in which he's emphasising that what he's writing here is basic doctrine, truths that they should know. But more likely, I think, is that he's addressing his readers affectionately. He's an old man with apostolic authority, mature in the faith. John is showing his love for his younger brothers and sisters in Christ, children. Or in verse 7 of chapter 2, he begins, Beloved. John is addressing the readers of his letter affectionately. And he reminds them that they, that we, are in the last hour. We're in that period of time between Jesus' first and his second coming. We are in the last hour awaiting the age to come, which will be ushered in by Jesus' second coming. And there is nothing else that needs to happen in salvation history before Jesus' second coming. And it's in that sense that we're in the last hour. Jesus could return any time. And John acknowledges in verse 18 that they know that Antichrist is coming. But, but who is Antichrist and what exactly does John mean by that? Well, although Antichrist feels like it's a commonly word, used word in the Bible, it actually only appears four times. And all of those references are in 1 and 2 John. And this is the first use in the whole Bible of the word Antichrist. The word itself, anti-Christos, simply means against Christ or in the place of Christ. Or as um, John says in verse 22, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. But I think we can be more specific in verse 18 John seems to contrast a single Antichrist who is coming with the many Antichrists who have already appeared. And I want to take a brief look at a few passages that I think will help us understand the single Antichrist that John is referring to. Some references to this same Antichrist, but by other names. So first, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So here we have this reference to the prince who is to come, or the ruler who is to come, depending on your translation, who will set up in the temple an abomination that causes desolation. And Jesus himself refers to this same prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus reaffirms 
Daniel's prophecy, whilst making it clear that whatever this refers to clearly hasn't happened at the point that Jesus is referring to it. And whilst some commentators and theologians would have us believe that this was fulfilled in the Roman destruction of the temple in AD 70, I actually see no evidence that's the case. The only first-hand account of the destruction of the temple is from Jewish historian Josephus. And whilst the account shows the horror of what took place, there is nothing in it that makes a strong case for Daniel's prophecy being fulfilled, at least not in full. In fact, there's a really good case that 1 John is written somewhere around 90 to 95 AD, which is obviously after the destruction of the temple, in which case John, writing in the book of 1 John, is referring to the Antichrist who is still to come. But let's keep going with other references to this Antichrist. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 16. For behold, I'm going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing, seek the scattered, heal the broken, or sustain the one standing, but will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hooves. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. His arm will be totally withered and his right eye will be blind. So here I believe we have another prophecy of Antichrist, this time referred to as the worthless shepherd. And next let's turn to the New Testament, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Paul refers to this Antichrist figure as the man of lawlessness who will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And finally, turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, reading from verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast, who can wage war against it? So here in Revelation, John refers to the Antichrist figure as the beast who acts as a puppet of Satan, the dragon, he makes war against Christian believers and causes unbelievers to worship him. So across each of these passages, we see what I strongly believe is the same figure called by various names, the ruler who is to come, the one who makes desolate, the worthless shepherd, the man of lawlessness, the beast, Antichrist, a powerful end times ruler who will oppose Christ and his followers a man who will put himself in the place of Christ, a man who will persecute Christians and lead many astray, a man who will rise shortly before Christ's return, but who has not yet come. And John's readers are aware of these prophecies and the coming of this man, but John is warning his readers. He is warning us, even though this ultimate Antichrist is coming, we mustn't forget that we are surrounded by many Antichrists right now. Not the 
ultimate figure pointed to by the prophecies we've just seen, but people with the same spirit, the same motivation, the same desire to oppose Christ and to stand in his place. This antichrist spirit is present in false teachers who lead people astray with false gospels and false views of who Jesus is. John Piper says it like this, the essence of the Antichrist spirit is to deny that Jesus was the Christ or to deny that the Christ was fully incarnate in Jesus. The spirit of Antichrist does whatever it can to diminish Christ and substitute other views or other persons for the true incarnate Son of God. Or as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Or as Paul says at the start of 1 Timothy chapter 4, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to, to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. Brothers and sisters, as we find ourselves nearing the end of the last hour, we should heed these warnings. We should expect false teachers. We should be on our guard against false teaching and false teachers seeking to lead us astray. And isn't that exactly where we find ourselves today? A visible church that is just full of heresy. False teachers everywhere. False views of Jesus everywhere, so-called believers chasing after false gospels of comfort and happiness and wealth, so-called believers with little understanding of the Bible and no spiritual discernment. Brothers and sisters, we should heed John's warnings and learn how to recognise false teachers, antichrists. And today I want to look at the characteristics of these false teachers under three headings. First, Antichrists or false teachers depart from Christian fellowship in verses 19 to 21. Second, false teachers deny the Christian faith in verses 22 to 25. And third, false teachers deceive the Christian faithful in verses 26 and 27. False teachers depart, deny and deceive. Read with me from verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. False teachers depart from fellowship with true believers. They depart from the truth and they depart from fellowship and they take people with them. And whilst in today's landscape where we have so many churches, false teachers might not literally have gone out from our church, but isn't this still exactly what we see today? Charismatic leaders starting their own churches without accountability, departing from orthodox teaching of the gospel and teaching what people want to hear. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 puts it like this, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Many Churches today are so popular, so apparently successful, because they teach exactly what people want to hear. Gospels of health, wealth and happiness. A God who gives us what we want and requires nothing from us except some 
seed funding. Not a true gospel of repentance, self-denial and obedience. And it's sad, but it shouldn't be surprising to us. But I also don't want us to lose the magnitude of what John is saying here in verse 19. Remember that the mechanism of salvation is that God chooses us. He predestines us. He calls us. In John chapter 6, verse 37, we read, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. God's call is effectual. Everyone who is called responds. And everyone who responds to God's call stays called. Or to put it another way, everyone who is truly saved stays saved. To everyone who is truly saved, God gives the ability to persevere, to abide in him. So if that's true, then here is what John is saying in verse 19 of today's passage. He's saying that if false teachers and so-called believers depart from Christian fellowship to follow a false gospel, a false view of Jesus, then they were never believers in the first place. This is not people losing their salvation. This is proof that people who appeared to be saved were never saved in the first place. And God, in his sovereignty, allows this to happen as a means of removing non-believers from the church. But hang on a minute, I can hear you asking, what does that mean for my assurance of salvation? How do I know that I am truly saved? How can I know that I am? I'm a true believer. Well, if this passage ended at verse 19, we might be in trouble, but John reminds us of this wonderful truth in verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Brothers and sisters, as true believers, we do have an assurance of our salvation. We do have assurance because we have the Holy Spirit, our built-in lie detector, an anointing from the Holy One, the Holy Spirit who protects us from error and helps us to persevere in the truth. Now, I don't think this means that we can never be wrong, but the Holy Spirit dwells in us, guiding us, And if we listen to the Spirit, he will help us discern truth from lies. And perhaps some of us would benefit from spending a little more time listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So we've seen how false teachers depart from Christian fellowship. Let's now turn our attention to verses 22 to 25, how false teachers deny the Christian faith. Read with me from verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he made he himself made to us eternal life. In this letter, John never explicitly states the heresy that he's addressing, but we get a pretty clear sense of it in these verses. And as we saw earlier, John is addressing an early form of Gnosticism that offers a special secret knowledge, a special anointing, something only for the initiated. Mystical knowledge, including the idea that the physical realm was inherently sinful or inferior. Supposed knowledge that said Jesus might have been God, but he couldn't have been truly man. God wouldn't stoop to become flesh. And we can see a greater hint of this in 1, chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. So in this letter, John is correcting this Gnostic view. In Jesus, God became truly flesh, a man that John saw, touched, and heard, fully man and fully God. And John says, if you don't believe that, then you don't know God at all. Again, don't miss the significance of this point. For Jesus to be our saviour, we must have the right view of him. To know God, we must know the true Jesus, the Jesus who is fully man and fully God. One person, two natures. Denying the true nature of the Son won't save us from our sins. In the same way that believing Jesus is a fictional character won't save us, believing that God was not a man won't save us either. Or the more modern heresy of believing that Jesus gave up his God nature when he emptied himself, that's not a saving view of Jesus either. Brothers and sisters, what we believe about who Jesus is has eternal consequences. We can't just ignore the issue because it seems too difficult or because theology isn't really our thing. We have to work hard by reading the Bible, by studying the Bible to discover what God has told us about his son. Brothers and sisters, I know that in this church we have been taught a right view of Jesus, the true gospel. The gospel that Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God, died to take the punishment that we deserve. He bore the wrath of holy God on the cross. He died, was buried, and three days later he was raised to life. He ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and we await his return with a deep longing so that God might be glorified. And we confess Jesus as Lord and acknowledge that he is the way the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. This is the true gospel. And John encourages us, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Brothers and sisters, if this truth remains in us, then we will remain in the Son and in the Father. If we believe the truth and show that belief through our obedience to Christ and our love for others, then we will remain in him. He will give us the strength to persevere to the end. We will permanently remain in him. We will abide in him with the promise of eternal life as our hope. So we've seen how antichrists or false teachers depart from Christian fellowship in verses 19 to 21. And we've seen how false teachers deny the Christian faith in verses 22 to 25. And now we're going to look at how false teachers deceive the Christian faithful in verses 26 and 27. Read with me from verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. The third characteristic of antichrists, of false teachers, of those who deny and oppose Christ, is that they are deceivers. They depart, they deny, and they deceive. John Piper says the following, What strikes me as I read forthright denials of historical biblical Christianity the atoning death of Jesus for our sins, the omniscience and sovereignty of God, the second coming of the Lord in glory, what strikes me is the ease with which many people are deceived. Two things account for this, a lack of grounding in the word of God and a lack of life in the Holy Spirit. Or to put it another way, 
When people have no theological depth and no vital experience of the Holy Spirit, they are sitting ducks for the deceiver and the antichrist. Amen. Or to say what is essentially the same thing more succinctly, John MacArthur says, the greatest problem facing the church today is its lack of discernment. It's true, isn't it? I'm often amazed by the lack of biblical literacy and discernment of so-called Christians. And what saddens me even more is that people don't even seem to care if they are right or wrong. They don't care about truth, or in some cases, even think that truth seems to exist. Brothers and sisters, as true believers, we needn't be afraid of heresy. True believers cannot be permanently deceived. But we must read and study God's word. And as we do, the Holy Spirit and the anointing from the Holy One will help us and teach us about all things. John isn't saying that we don't need to go to church or that we don't need to learn from preaching and teaching. He's reminding us that the Holy Spirit dwelling in us will show us truth from lies. The Holy Spirit, our helper, will show us how to discern error. The Holy Spirit will help us to abide in Christ to remain in the Son and in the Father, to persevere to the end. And do you see the contrast here? To abide in him, to abide in the truth, the opposite of departing from the fellowship, of departing from the truth. Brothers and sisters, my prayer for all of us hearing this message today is that we accept and know the true gospel, the true Jesus, and that in knowing him, we would abide in him with full assurance of salvation through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, resolved to walk in obedience and in love for others, to walk in the light as he himself is in the light, not to save us but to testify to our salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that as believers we have the anointing of your Holy Spirit showing us error and teaching us as we study your word. Give us courage to speak against false views of the gospel and of who Jesus is. Help us to abide in him and persevere until death or until Jesus returns. In his precious name we pray. Amen.